Julie Edwards on this beautiful first Thursday in the month of May. So glad that you are tuned in tonight to Chew in the Chat. It's a good hour ahead because Dr. Andy Lovett, who is a general surgeon at CHI Memorial Surgical Associates in Hickson, is on the show with me tonight. Great to have you tonight, Dr. Thank Lovett. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. I think it's interesting, the topic of general surgery. And in the hour ahead, uh, we'll touch on everything from skin cancers to an effort that you have going on for Stop the Bleed Month. But when I think of a surgeon, I will tell you, I tend to think more of specialists. I I think we tend to forget that as a general surgeon, you are well-versed in everything. Well, uh, it does make for an interesting day in a variety, so it keeps keeps me fresh, I think. How how does it work? Because when people are, when they find out that they're going to have a surgery, let's face it, most of us don't have very many in our lives. Some people will never even have one. But I would imagine it's a rather uh, intimidating feeling for patients when they find out they're going to have to, quote, go under the knife. It can be. Just the fear of the unknown, if you haven't experienced before. And for some people, it's giving up control because they're under anesthesia and they have a fear of that. Um, Sometimes it's uh, a friend or a family member's experience that may or may not have gone the way they liked. and, And that can can cause some trepidation for them too. But um, a lot of what I do is routine, is what people would call elective surgery. I also am available for emergencies. Um, and that's when sometimes people aren't prepared. You mentioned the anesthesia part mm-hmm. of it before we talk about the emergency side. I know that most people listening tonight probably are very aware of the team approach that Memorial Hospital has with everything from um, the Mary Ellen Loker Breast Care Center to other, Reskillern, all of it. It's a very much a team approach. So when you are looking at any type of a surgical procedure, you too are part of a team. It, it, we do emphasize that, and there's also safety checks as a result of that. I mean, that's built into the system. There's multiple people that verify information. You'll get asked the same question by four or five different people there about your medical history, your medications, any adverse reactions to medications, that type of thing. So it's a safety thing built in, and we all try to check behind each other. So you mentioned that very a large number of the procedures that you do every week are scheduled things, that they're just kind of routine, as you say, surgeries. What would that be, things like tonsillectomies and that type of thing? or Uh, As a general surgeon, um, on my variety of cases may include hernia repairs, gallbladder surgery, breast cancer, colon cancer, appendixes. Sometimes we'll take out a spleen, uh, bowel obstructions, skin cancer, hemorrhoids, uh, occasionally an amputation. Uh, Sometimes it's a wound care Mm -hmm. issue. Um, We also place ports for chemotherapy access, do lymph node biopsies. So if you are that varied, then you must know pretty much every doctor in town because you hit every field of medicine pretty well, much. Well, I, I don't do any intracranial surgery. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't do any bone and joint surgery or spine surgery. And the, and the gynecology physicians take care of the women's health issues. Uh, right. They do send the breast cancer patients to other specialties like myself. So when you are in a position that you know you're going to need to have something done and they get to meet you face to face and the other doctors on the team and have you hold their hand uh, before they get taken away into surgery, that's one thing. But as you mentioned, then there can be acute situations where uh, people have an emergency need and there you are. So you have this passion uh, as a general surgeon that you're bringing to Chattanooga as much as you're able to in the course of the next month. This is Stop the Bleed Month, the month of May. It is. It's the first national Stop the Bleed Month. So what does that mean exactly? Well, the Stop the Bleed initiative uh, was started uh, after the Sandy Hook incident in 2012. Shortly after that, the American College of Surgeons and their Committee on Trauma got together to find ways to educate the public on how to, quote, stop the bleed. And and it was important because they realized that people were dying and had died from bleeding that could have been stopped if someone knew what to do at that moment before first responders get there. Um, so life-threatening bleeding from an extremity injury can take someone's life in 
a minute to a minute and a half. Really? Um, and that's not time for the rescue squad to get there. And if it's an incident like Sandy Hook, even if they're on site, they can't go in until scene is secured. But if you know, you're know you there and you happen to know what to do, it could save some, some A lives. minute to a minute and a half. Sure. That's how quickly it can happen. Sure. So is it fair to say that most of us freeze in a situation? We talk about, what is it, flight or fight? So do most of us tend to kind of I've had a I've had a situation once before where I was stunned by something. I won't go into the story, but it was like a cartoon or something happening because I truly could not even emit a sound. I was sure. so scared. Sure, the unexpected can can cause any range of reactions from people. So even if you know what to do, you may in the situation have to collect a few seconds to to gather yourself, but uh, I think if we can broaden the number of people that know how to stop life-threatening bleeding, mm-hmm. that uh, hopefully somebody might uh, be able to use those skills one day. Well, I know that you are hoping that as people listen to you tonight, they'll think about calling the office because you're more than willing to come out with some tourniquets and uh, all of your knowledge, whether it's to church groups or businesses, to kind of educate them. Sure. But why? And we'll give you the phone number, by the way, everybody, before the show is over a couple of times, actually. But walk us through a little bit of some some basic things. Like we ca- we think about keeping emergency kits in our cars. Is it a good idea to have some kind of a, a kit with you? Sure, it's a great idea. Um, basically, uh, a tourniquet, which I brought so you can look at. Obviously, our viewers can't see it, but uh, the the one that's very popular that I use in in uh, the talks that I give is a call it CAT tourniquet, C-A-T, for Combat Applied Tourniquet. And it's something that you can actually put on yourself easily one-handed. Hmm. Um, Wait, so so you're saying that if somebody, if, if each of us had one, then if we were the victim of something, as long as we were conscious, we could apply this to our own self. Sure, but wow. it's critical that you have it available in that minute to minute and a half is um, for a limb threat, uh, life-threatening bleeding on a limb is about the time that you have before you lose consciousness. After that, you can't put the tourniquet on yourself. Right. So it's very critical to have it handy. How do you know? A dumb question maybe, but for me, if I was injured and I saw blood coming anywhere from me, I would think it was the worst. But how, how do you know when it's that critical to need that tourniquet? Well, the volume, um, the volume of bleeding, the amount that's, of blood that you see, whether it's under pressure or pulsatile bleeding, uh, those are some clues that it might be um, a life-threatening injury to a major artery. So that's the issue, is if, if it's hit an artery. If a the major wound... artery or a large vein, actually. Uh, but the arteries are under pressure, and uh, you can exsanguinate rather rapidly from a major arterial injury. Do we tend to bleed differently depending on the age we are? If it affects, you mentioned Sandy Hook. Um there, I guess there could be some age-related factors. Um, older people that may have plaque buildup in their arteries, their arteries may not be able to spasm down the natural response to injury. And so that spasm is kind of our way of protecting ourselves in a, uh, an acute bleed situation. Um, some older people may be on some medications that make it harder for them to stop bleeding. Right. So... so- uh, we're getting close to our first commercial, and I know that this is a great time to be talking about this because now that the weather's getting pretty and uh, everyone's wanting to be outside, with the fun and adventurous side of life can also come some risks associated. So let's catch a commercial. When we come back, let's talk more about some things that we can have on hand besides the cat tourniquet in case we come across somebody in need of help, whether we're out on a hike or on the boat or even just on the road. Plus, we're going to talk skin care as we head into summer. Dr. Andy Levitt with CHI Memorial. We're back in just a minute. Talk Radio 102.3. Welcome back, everybody. During the commercial, Dr. Levitt actually got out this cat tourniquet. I have seen these before, and why I don't have one, I don't know. This thing is so small and compact. You can easily put it in a pocketbook if you're a woman. I don't know quite where a man would keep it, I guess, in their back pocket. I have a little trauma kit that I take with me. Uh, there's one in my car. There's one that's clipped to my daily um, messenger bag. Um, so so if- you demonstrated it for me uh, in the commercial, and, and I'll kind of walk you through it because it's very self-explanatory. I, like I said earlier, 
would be that person who would freeze, I think, in the crisis situation. So it's kind of guiding you. There's a little red tab that lets you know that you want that to point towards your heart. Sure. That and right? that's just because it's easier to tighten pulling it in towards the body than trying to pull it out away from the body. Okay, so it's not critical. It's just to make it easier for sure, you. Sure, if you're applying it on yourself. Okay. So. Um, so then you said this is not intended to be comfortable, however. No, when it's tightened down enough to stop arterial bleeding, it will be very tight and it will be uncomfortable. And you just know to twist it until, the until you stops. see it. What do you do? I guess the obvious is there if it doesn't stop. It's you just... can always apply another tourniquet higher up. Really? Sure. You can put two on the next one. Uh, there, there, a lot of people that teach put the tourniquet as high up on the limb as you can from the beginning. Okay. But at least several inches above the injury. Okay. Uh, and if you have room for a second one, like in a very large person, you might need a second tourniquet. Uh, and if, if you don't have one handy, then direct pressure okay. over the wound. I guess the very nature, though, of an emergency is that it's not cooperative. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an emergency, right? right. So. Sometimes you're in a situation where this is not enough because the wound is in a place where you can't apply the tourniquet. Sure. So what do you do then? Well, the tourniquets work uh, on limbs up to a certain point. They have to be applied 90 degrees to the actual to the axial uh, direction of the limb. So if it's the injury is high up on your leg, you can't apply the tourniquet that high. Then we teach packing for penetrating injuries uh, or lacerations. And packing is with any, preferably with clean gauze, uh, but in a pinch, any material that you can get, clothing items, uh, shreds uh, shreds of shirt or T-shirt or jeans, and you pack that down into the wound very tightly and then hold pressure over that. And again, that won't be comfortable either. Right. But if it's a life or death situation, then that well, may be required. Okay, let's talk about... Um I guess let's talk about a situation where you are not the patient yourself. You've come across something or you're out with people and somebody does get injured. Uh, if there's a group of people, for example, is it a good idea to have one person helping with the wound care and stopping the bleeding while somebody else is on the phone to 911? Sure. And are sure. there some basic things you ought to say when you call 911? Well, you certainly want to identify yourself and your location and what the problem is and that you have someone that has potentially life-threatening bleeding. And uh, once they hear that life-threatening bleeding, they should clue in that maybe they can give some guidance. If you aren't comfortable or don't know what to do, they can perhaps guide you with what to do. Mm -hmm. But the, you, your point, you, the point you made about having someone actually put pressure on the wound and start that right away while someone else is calling is very valid because, like we talked about earlier, you can bleed a lot inside of a minute, minute and a half, and you can't get a phone call done that soon. Right. So. I guess we can't have this conversation and then not also address what happens when these life-saving techniques are put in place and the patient is now taken by ambulance to the hospital and the critical need for blood. Sure. Um, we we You asked about the time stamp on the... Yeah. On the tourniquet, and so if you do happen to have a pen handy, you write down the time that the tourniquet was applied. Yeah, there's a little on this tourniquet. <clears throat> I didn't go into that. I'm sorry, but there's a, a piece of Velcro that very clearly says time, and you said that's for the first responders. Sure, when uh, when they come and hopefully get you to a medical facility, then the, the the people that are caring for you there will know exactly how long the tourniquet has been on. How much blood do we have in our bodies? Is there? It uh, depends on your weight and ideal body weight, but it can be around seven liters. Seven liters. Yeah. So when you give a pint of blood at Blood Assurance, uh, how I don't, can't do the math quickly. Well, it's it shouldn't affect you physiologically. Some people may feel a little lightheaded. At but first you give a me. pint of sure. blood, right? Sure. And how many pints are in a liter? <laughs> you don't know either? Conversion. But you, a liter is <laughs> roughly a quart, so okay. give or take. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's slightly less than a quart, so, uh, you know, a a pint is about three or four. I don't know, but it's a lot. <laughs> like two cups, two two cups make a pint, and how many pints? I don't know. We got to go back to eighth grade, don't we? <laughs> I left that behind when I became an English major in college, yeah. and clearly you have other people who you can rely on that uh, for. I wouldn't be a good Jeopardy uh, person as a general surgeon. That. But the point I guess I was going to make is you realize the volume of blood needed. Sure. Because if you do, and we ha you see these situations pretty regularly at the hospital, right? where people are at a, at a critical need of blood? 
occasionally. Hopefully, fortunately, it's not common. Okay. Um, and we may transfuse a unit or two here and there, which equates to about a pine, you can guesstimate. But um, we're, we're trying to not trans. There's an actual push to not transfuse unless it's indicated. So the, the transfusion requirements are stricter now. Okay, so if you are in that situation where you need to apply the tourniquet to yourself and you stop the blood, you stop the bleed, sure. then when you get to the hospital, you might not need additional blood? Well, it depends on how much you've lost, what your physiologic reserves are, how overall, what your overall health is. Um, also, what happens when they take the tourniquet off, if it has to be something surgically repaired, then they probably leave it on until they get to the operating room. Do you think most of us would be surprised to see how, how engineered the human body actually is to heal? I mean, do you see situations in surgery perhaps when you first started where you thought I don't know how anybody can get through this and yet we can I see it every day uh, not just when I first started it's a miracle the human body and the design um, there's a lot that we take for granted mm -hmm. you're right so I find it interesting so so to that end I think I fall I'm a pretty healthy person but I I will admit that I think I get this false sense of security sometimes because medical knowledge has just progressed so much in the last even 20 or 30 years of what we can treat effectively. So you, I tend to think sometimes it'll be okay because they can fix it, right? They can fix it. But that ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure, you cannot overstate. So we'll segue a little bit into all of the sunbathers out there who sure. are going to be hitting the pool on Memorial Day weekend and the risks of sun exposure on your skin. Sure. Uh, May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month, and the thing I'd like to get across to the public is uh, avoiding the problem in the first place. So good skin hygiene, good sun protection, um, and it's important that we try to get the message across to younger individuals because to, for I guess lack of, I don't want to generalize, but they tend to be the most outdoorsy mm -hmm. age group, and also they're less likely to take protective measures. Well, you tend to think, let's face it, I mean, I remember being 22 years sure, old, and I was never going to turn 40, sure. right, yeah, um, much less 50. <laughs> uh, so it just, you tend to think that it's not going to ever catch up with you, but um, let me ask you this, in terms of sunscreen, you go to the store and you can choose between 10, 15, 20, upwards to 60 SPF. I heard once that once you reached 30, Correct. it really doesn't do any good to buy Correct. the higher ones. The, the recommendation is at least 30 SPF, um, and 30 should be adequate if you apply it, apply it correctly and apply it repeatedly if you're going to be out for an extended period. Is that our problem, that we don't put it on frequently enough? Well, that's one problem, but a lot of people don't put it on at all. Um, so it's very important if you're going to be out in the sun, especially in the, the midday hours, which you ideally would like to avoid, but mm -hmm. you can't always do it. So uh, at least apply it every couple of hours. If you're swimming or water sports, you may need to apply it more frequently. I know that when my kids were younger and in camps and things, and they always wanted the spray-on um, sunscreen as opposed to the, the lotion, because, oh, Mom, that lotion's so gross, and they wanted the spray-on stuff. But I always felt better about the lotion because I could really control where it was going. It makes you think that. But there's that, no difference? If applied correctly, SPF 30 spray-on should be just as effective as a lotion. Okay. Um, what about your head? Do we think, because we've had my kids at the beach, I have two daughters, but they've had their scalps burned. Sure. Um, a wide-brim hat is, is a great idea. Um, sunglasses um, to avoid potential cataract from UV damage later on in life, mm -hmm. um, and then avoiding peak hours if possible, and then the, the regular and repeated use of 30, at least 30 SPF. Okay, so that's your ounce of prevention. When we come back, let's talk about what do you do, though, if, and maybe it's not always for sun exposure, but if you find yourself with a skin cancer, we'll kind of walk through the different stages and the different types that are there uh, and how they go about treating them as a general surgeon at Memorial Hospital. Dr. Andy Lovett, the hour is halfway through. We're back with more in just a minute. Okay. 
timing of this show could not be better because we're all going to want to get out and enjoy the beautiful scenery of the Tennessee Valley. And let's face it, put those bathing suits on and have some fun. So the fact that we're talking with Dr. Andy Lovett about the concerns with skin protection, uh, it's, it's perfect timing. Moles, you said that a lot of us, my, my, my husband is Italian, so I'm very fair-skinned, Scotch-Irish. But my daughters, both, one especially, has a proclivity to getting moles. Mm -hmm. Um, And I watch them like a hawk. If they don't change shape, is that a good sign? Stability is always a good sign with any medical condition in general. Uh, Things that change um, rapidly or a significant change often raises our attention. So a lot of times we get asked to look at a mole by a patient and Um, there are certain characteristics that we look for with suspicious lesions that might be melanoma or one of the other type of skin cancers. Like what? Well, the easy way to remember it is A, B, C, D, E. And uh, A stands for asymmetry. Um, If the the mole is, um, if you can't draw a line down the middle and it's a mirror image on one side or the other. Okay. So... Uh, that's one characteristic that might make us a little more suspicious. B is border irregularity, if it's a nice, smooth, rounded border to the lesion, or if it's not, like scalloped or jagged. Okay. Those uh, scalloped or jagged uh, edged moles would be more suspicious. Okay. C stands for color variation. So if you have a nice, even brown or even darker color mole that's all the same color, then that's usually a sign that it's not as worrisome. If they're different colors or different variations of color, uh, then those would be more suspicious. Okay. D is diameter. Um, The bigger the mole, the more we want to look at it. And the size that I have people think about is the diameter of a pencil eraser. Okay. So anything bigger than that, we definitely want to have a look at. Okay. And E stands for evolving or change, which is what you alluded to earlier. Something mm-hmm. changes significantly if it grows, um, changes shape, bleeds, uh, ulcerates. Those are things that you'd want to bring to your doctor's attention. So does that mean then that if you have this perfectly round little mole that you've not ever had to worry about, but then 10 years from now you could notice some changes within that mole? Sure. Is that how it works? Sure. Occasionally we see something like that. Or is it that then... so? So there are different types of skin cancers, right? There's basal cell. What's the other kind? Uh, Squamous cell. Okay. The three common ones are basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. All right. Melanoma is the one that we really want to raise awareness for because it causes, um, it it can cause death. Um, The others, more of a nuisance, but occasionally those can be more serious. But melanoma is the ones that can spread to other parts of the body, and that is where we run into trouble. So if we can pick them up early before they become advanced stage, then they're curable. So, um, okay, let's talk first about the picking them up early. If you're listening to this tonight and you've got just some some moles, maybe that you've just lived with for a long time and never thought to go, would you go to the dermatologist? Would you come to you? How do you, and you, what do you do, get them biopsied? Well, you could certainly bring it up to your primary care physician. Uh, they are very experienced in looking at moles because they do physical exams on everybody every year. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times they catch something that's new uh, or changing and they refer them. Uh, sometimes they may even biopsy or excise them themselves. Okay. I've had uh, some family physicians that don't do those biopsies, but they do send them when they're suspicious. So a surgeon, a dermatologist, those would be excellent if you needed to have a second look at it or even a biopsy. The dermatologists often will do... Uh, something called dermoscopy, which is a, a special type of magnification, mm-hmm. uh, and look at moles. I don't have that in my office, but they're trained to do that. So that's another step that you could use. Certainly if it's suspicious enough, then taking a biopsy, which is easily done in the office, um, is the right thing to do. Does insurance typically cover the removal of a mole, even if it's just suspicious? You know? If it's suspicious or uncertain behavior and is documented in that way, then in in general, they they don't have a problem covering it. What they don't want to cover is people that come in with age spots and mm-hmm. cosmetic benign things. lesions. Um, Medicare especially won't um, cover removal of those. So if you have something that just makes a doctor scratch their head a little bit, that 
at the moment it's fine. I wouldn't worry about it, but you want to keep an eye on it. Say that's sure. what they say. Do some people just choose to go ahead and preventively take it off? I've had a few patients that have asked for that, and uh, if it has enough suspicious characteristics, it's reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's in the area that's unsightly, mm-hmm. uh, that's not covered by their clothing, and they want it removed for that reason. Right. Um, but as far as skin cancer awareness, uh, I think if everybody can remember the A, B, C, D, E's, mm-hmm. remember to use good sun protection, um, and if they have a question about anything, to make sure that they bring it up to their physician. Okay, so then there is the fact that those of us who are listening tonight who are maybe raising children, so we're thinking back to our own 1980s or earlier days of iodine and baby oil <laughs> and the ways that we tried to get a tan. You don't want your kids doing that. But no, no, no. With, with melanoma especially or perhaps all three types, the damage and the creation that leads to the cancer was done many years prior. Even if you've been putting on sunscreen, great, for the last 10 years, if you sunbaked when you were a kid, sure. you could have a problem? Sure. One of the parts of the medical history when someone comes with a suspicious lesion is, have you ever had a bad sunburn? Um, so you are correct. The solar damage from UV radiation is cumulative, meaning it adds up over time. So a sunburn that you had as a child and then another sunburn or two as a teenager it, it adds to the amount of damage done to your skin DNA. And uh, so the, the more you do that, the higher your risk. People like yourself that are fair-skinned, uh, right. red-head. Right. Um, I tan because my freckles run together. Northern right. European background, that type of thing, tend to be more risk for, for melanomas. How do you define a bad sunburn? I had a doozy in the eighth grade. I got sun poisoning down at Disney World, so I know that was that one. That sounds bad. That was a bad one. Um, but for a lot of people, how, how would they know that they have a bad sunburn? Well, if it blisters, it's pretty bad. Um, the amount of pain that you're having, the amount of area that's involved. Uh, but we want to try to avoid any sunburn if we can. Um, is peeling just a natural condition of getting sun? Or if you're peeling, is that a sign? It that means that there was a little damage done. Uh, our body, ha- body does have the ability to repair some of that. But over time, if enough damage happens, then you can change the cell's nucleus enough to where uh, you can develop one of these skin cancers. Okay, so you go to any pool uh, in suburbia these days, and you're going to see a lot of kids in swim shirts, those protective shirts. Are those a good idea to wear? I think so, uh, especially if they have an SPF rating, which you may see on the tag when you purchase them. So you do want to make sure they're not all made the same then? Sure, and I would still put on sunscreen underneath the shirt. You would? I would. How about sunglasses? You mentioned earlier with cataracts. I know you're not an ophthalmologist, but, um, you know, you can go to get get sunglasses on the cheap or you can put a lot of money into them. So where do you what do you look for with a good pair of sunglasses? Well, you want to look for how the the percentage of UV blockage that they offer. So they should have somewhere on the label, you know, the amount of UVA and UVB that they block. So the higher the rating, the better. Okay, Um, when people come in or. You know, some cancers, you think about breast cancer as having kind of a genetic component, other types as well. Are some families, you mentioned the Northern European heritage as being a precursor sometimes, but are some people just more prone to developing skin cancers within their family? Uh, I I think there are instances of that. Um, That's not so much what we bring up with with the may skin cancer awareness sure. uh, is more for screening and prevention but if you have several members in your family that have had uh, melanoma then you certainly would want to be aware uh, melanoma can occur any place it can occur even places that have never had any sun damage like the really? bottom of your feet um, the retina in you know of your really? eye um, so and it, it does my knowledge of it is that it tends to spread rather quickly so um, yeah I know you mentioned the ABCDEs if it's a melanoma versus a basal cell, does it look different to the naked eye, or do you have to biopsy it to find well, out? Well, melanomas usually look different than basal cells. The basal cells have different characteristics, such as a rolled border and maybe a little ulcer in the middle, and they tend to not be as pigmented as melanomas because melanomas are named after the melanocyte or the 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 part of the skin that gives it its color, and mm-hmm. the people that have darker skin have more melanin. Um, but you can have amelanotic melanomas, which are paler in appearance, 
uh, so the most I, common. I would think that, you know, doctor's offices do get busy. You can't help it when your roster is full. So if you if you suspect something, is it really important to make that clear when you're making the yes. appointment? Because time is important. Yes, it is. Uh, sometimes we get lucky and stumble across something. I've actually picked up some melanomas on patients that were in my office for something completely unrelated. I just happen to look at them and say, how long has this mold been here? And you know, we take a look at it and discuss the ABCDEs and do a biopsy and it turns out to be melanoma. Right. So if you think there's something that you want to have looked at, certainly bring it up. Okay, I promise that I will give you the phone number. I'm going to give it to you again. But as we head into commercial, uh, so far, if you're interested either in learning more um, about the skin cancer prevention and the skin uh, treatments for the month of May and heading through the summer or in having Dr. Lovett come out and speak to your group for Stop the Bleed, you'll find him at CHI Memorial Surgical Associates in Hickson. Their phone number is 408-3010. When we come back, I'm curious about... Uh, robotic surgery versus the old-fashioned kind and what your thoughts are on that. Sure. The remaining part of our show in just a minute. So glad you're listening. Talk Radio 102.3. I'm sure that Dr. Lovett would be the first one to say that he hopes he never has to see you in his office. That would be a wonderful thing if we could all live totally healthy lives. But let's face it, most of us at some point are going to have something that needs to be corrected. So we went to commercial, Dr. Lovett, talking about uh, robotic surgery versus open surgery. Uh, You say really, as from a patient standpoint, it's not that big of an issue which way you go. Correct. Uh, robotic surgery is, is laparoscopic surgery that is done with robotic instruments. So if you've had a laparoscopic gallbladder surgery or a laparoscopic hernia repair or appendix removal, uh, the techniques are the same with the using the robot. It's just the the, type, the tool that you use to do it. Is there a recovery time that's different if you go laparoscopically versus open? Laparoscopic versus open, yes. Uh, laparoscopic versus laparoscopic with a robot is is kind of a wash. Okay. So um, how do you make the decision when to do a laparoscopic procedure versus an open procedure? Well, there's some patients that aren't good candidates for op- for laparoscopic surgery with or without a robot. If they've had extensive intra-abdominal surgery before, lots of scar tissue, certain body habitus types, um, or if they're not able to tolerate uh, inflating the abdomen with CO2 for any number of reasons, then we might choose to do something open versus laparoscopic. You Um, know, I would think it's a terrible thing to have someone come into your office, and I imagine this happens sometimes, who does need a surgery, but they're not healthy enough to undergo it. Well, that's one of the decisions that we make when we have our patient consultation. You have to not only ask questions and examine regarding the actual chief complaint, but you take a good medical history because you want to know, is this patient going to tolerate anesthesia? Is this patient going to tolerate the position we might need to put them in Mm -hmm. for surgery? Do they have other risk factors that might make anesthesia more risky, like severe heart dysfunction, um, uncontrolled diabetes, uh, COPD from smoking, um, things that we might have a chance to modify before an operation, in which case we would try to address those issues if if, if we have the time. I know you mentioned that you don't do orthopedics. I have a, a daughter who has had several orthopedic surgeries, however, and uh, each time they would tell her to do a little bit of physical therapy even before we did the surgery to help her be stronger on recovery. So are there things, if you know you have a surgery scheduled, that you encourage people to do to make them as strong as possible? Sure. Going um, especially if you have risk factors such as diabetes, you want to have uh, as tight of glucose control as you can. If you're a smoker, ideally, if you could stop smoking at least two weeks before your operation, that would help reduce uh, complications such as infection, wound healing problems, um, post-operative uh, respiratory issues. Um, and for some of those people that have that, we will often give them an send the spirometer, which is an exerciser for their lungs uh, several weeks in advance. And if it's severe, we may have to have them see their pulmonologist 
uh, or if it's a heart issue or cardiologist mm-hmm. prior to surgery to try to tune up as much as we can to make it as safe as possible. Are there ever things that, that people can do to not have to go through a surgery? I know you said you do a lot of things like gallbladder and hernia. Are those things that can be prevented, actually? Well, not so much with the gallbladder. Hernias, um, hernias can occur without any particular reason. Some people are born with hmm. hernias. Some people are born with weaknesses that progress to hernias. Sometimes hernias occur in old surgical incisions because that tissue is weaker. Um, so as far as avoidance with hernias, if you can avoid um, straining as much as you can using proper lifting technique, uh, such as breathing through an exercise or a lift rather than holding your breath and bearing down, using your mm. legs more than your back, those type of things, or get ask for someone's help. Um, but aside from that, there's not that much that you can do to avoid a hernia. Um, just because you develop a hernia doesn't mean you have to have an operation either. Uh, if it's symptom-free and stable, uh, you can choose to observe that for, for any length of time and, really? unless something changes. Do people ever come into your office and sort of screen you before a surgery? Do they interview you? Uh, actually, they do um, <laughs> with some regularity. Uh, oftentimes, I'll have someone tell me that I may have taken care of a friend or family of theirs, and you know they, they ask some questions about me. Um, there are some online websites you can go to to look um, for ratings and that type of thing. I, I don't know that I put too much stock in that. I only know what mine is. But um, if you want to know about a surgeon in particular, I would say go ask the OR staff where that surgeon operates. Really? Sure. They'll tell you the, the straight story. I have a, um, I used to tell when my daughter was, was sick and I'd go to these appointments and I would say, please, I don't know what I don't know. So tell me everything, please. Um, people don't always know what questions to ask. So what are some basic things? Regarding picking a surgeon. Yeah. Oh, well, um, certainly if you have any friends or family that have had ex- a good experience or a bad experience, you can ask them. Um, but as like I said earlier, you'll get the best answer from the OR staff where that person operates. Okay. Um, or you can ask people that work at the hospital in the operating room or the recovery room who they would recommend. So I will tell you that if you ask about Dr. Love it. Probably besides saying, oh, he's great and he's a really nice guy and excellent at what he does, they're also going to probably tell you that he's a big Tar Heels fan, right? Well, I'm a North Carolina Tar Heel <laughs> graduate and grew up in eastern North Carolina. So. And glad to be back on the water, right, even though it's the Tennessee River? Well, it's not salt water, but it'll do. It'll do. So um, before I let you run, back to the Stop the Bleed campaign, and I'll give folks the number. When my younger daughter was born, she was born here in Chattanooga, And it surprised me because I didn't learn her blood type in the hospital, which I thought was very strange. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do we need to know our blood type? And if so, if we don't know it, how do we find out? If you know it, it's a good idea to have it written down somewhere, but it's something that can be easily checked at a a medical facility. Um, Regarding the bleeding control, there is a website that's called bleedingcontrol.org that you can go to and look up some more information. They have lots of uh, pamphlet material you can download. You can even look, search for a, a bleeding control class that may be offered. Um, I don't know if any that are scheduled right now, but certainly if those people, are available. And if people call your office, and I hope that they will, to say, yes, will you come please speak to our Wednesday night church supper uh, and teach us sure. what we need to know, will you bring examples of the cat tourniquet with you? Is sure. there a website where people can order them? You can order them from Amazon. Uh, okay. They actually have some knockoff ones if you want to have some for practice, and that's the other thing. If you have a one that you're going to carry for an emergency, I would say get a second one, maybe one of the knockoff ones, just to practice with. Okay. Uh, you don't want to repeatedly use your emergency tourniquet for weakening it or that makes uh, damaging it in some way. So they're, they're really inexpensive, um, and it's a good idea to have one of those handy, maybe some gauze, uh, maybe an ace wrap, maybe some, some gloves handy. Well, I didn't know I was coming tonight to get a takeaway prize, but I thank you for sharing the tourniquet with yeah, me. You're welcome. And I'll have to go home and figure out where to keep it. I won't keep it in the glove compartment of my car because then that won't do any good if I'm inside somewhere sure. and should need it. Let me give you the phone number, though, where you can call his office uh, and see about scheduling him to come out to meet with you. He is a delight to talk to, 408 3010 Dr. Andy Lovett. Again, you'll find him in Hickson at CHI Memorial uh, General Surgical Associates. Associates. Thank you. I'm glad you could yeah. finish the phrase.
Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Have a good night, everybody. We'll catch you next time.